All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today, we are going to be talking about how to uh, basically solar energy. I, I'm excited to learn how proteins have a role in this because I don't know anything about solar energy, and that will be fixed today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, uh, Bryant. Uh, welcome. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you like it? Sure. Uh, so hi, my name is Brian Chica. Um, so right now I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher at uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, in Golden, Colorado. Um, uh, and so that's one of the Department of Energy uh, national labs that uh, that one is focused exclusively on uh, more all aspects of like renewable energy. So everything from like biomass, uh, to solar cells, to uh, even like, you know, next generation grid technologies to wind technology. So they kind of do all of that. And they're the only lab that's focused exclusively on the renewable stuff. Um, whereas the other that, you know, there's other Department of Energy uh, national labs that uh, are very much, you know, they also do some of that as well. But a lot of them are like, uh, also focused on like nuclear energy and like managing the nation's uh, you know, large stockpile, you know, large involvement with uh, nuclear things like Los Alamos, you know, of course, famous for that, that kind of, those kind of places. But so that's where I work. Um, and so I work in the biosciences division. Um, and uh, in, uh, so I work under a scientist, Paul King, and our group, uh, we're kind of focused on like funda fundamental studies of how enzymes work, which are, you know, these little protein nanomachines that are inside all living things that kind of power everything that we do. Uh, and they do all of the important, um, you know, sort of uh, reactions that power our lives and, uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I did uh, my PhD at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, under uh, Brian Dyer and or we're also studying these kind of like hybrid uh, inorganic uh, enzyme hybrid materials, which I'll talk to you guys a little bit about. I guess I have a, a slide or two or a couple slides to just kind of like give you an overview of like the specific stuff I'm working on. Um, but yeah, that's that's me. That's me. Awesome. Oh, I'm excited to learn all about this. So if you want to start sharing your slides, now would be a good time. And everybody at home, if you have questions, submit that to that to submit them to that Q&A at the bottom. Um, and when Brian is done his uh, slideshow, we will launch into the questions. I already have a bunch. So bring your curiosity with you today. OK, can you see my? Uh... Yeah, that looks great. I... OK, great. Um, so. Um... Hi, everybody. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, slides prepared on like the specific area of like artificial photosynthesis uh, that I'm working on. So I work uh, with um, these, uh, these sort of hybrid systems that we've been developing, which uh, combine uh, nanoparticles, these certain semiconductor nanoparticles that we can make that are sort that can be uh, in aqueous solutions. So they're in water. And they're just these nanoparticles that are maybe like 10 nanometers long. Uh, and what we do is we put pro the specific proteins on the surface of them. Uh, and so here, can you see my pointer? Yeah, we can. We can see your little arrow. OK, cool. And so we, um, what we do is we put uh, these uh, specific proteins on the surface called enzymes. And these enzymes, um, are found in bacteria. And there's a couple of important ones that we've used that do very important reactions. So this one right here is called hydrogenase. And in bacteria, what that does is that takes uh, protons and electrons, which is basically you know, one component of water. So it basically takes water kind of and makes hydrogen out of it. Uh, and uh, so that's important for making a lot of the hydrogen that's all in our world. Uh, and then this other enzyme that I primarily work with right now is called nitrogenase. Now it's a very, very important enzyme. So that is the uh, enzyme in bacteria that takes nitrogen from the atmosphere and it converts it into ammonia. And basically before fertilizer was invented, all of the 
nitrogen in the world, which is also all of the, you know, everything that makes up the proteins in your body, it all came from this specific process. So bacteria converting nitrogen to ammonia. And that's what happens in the soil. Bacteria do this process. And that's actually what we do artificially is we have industrial processes that take nitrogen and convert it to ammonia to make fertilizer out of it. That's what fertilizer is, is that ammonia in the soil that lets plants make proteins because they can't make it. They can't make ammonia. The, they can't make ammonia basically on their own. They can't make their own fertilizer. They need, it needs to be either provided by bacteria or, uh, you know, provided by our industrial processes. Um, and so what we work on uh, here at the, in my group, in our group at the National Lab, uh, is these sort of hybrid materials where we basically take these proteins out of bacteria, we purify them, and then we combine them with these nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles are, uh, you know, these very interesting materials that have been developed by chemists in the past couple of decades where they're like tiny, tiny little silicon chips, almost like tiny little, well, you can imagine them as like tiny nano, nano scale uh, solar panels almost, like little tiny solar chunks of solar panel that are in solution. Right. And what you can do is basically these enzymes will attach to the surface of these little nanoparticles. And then when you illuminate these, uh, these particles, these particles act like antenna, they kind of absorb light uh, and then they can, uh, instead of generating electricity, if they were in a big solar panel, like they can actually directly transfer electrons to the protein. So they're like directly transferring electricity to these enzymes. And then so they're pumping electricity into these enzymes and that actually drives their process. So, you know, we can, if we have, for example, this hydrogenase on there and we illuminate it, we can actually make hydrogen from the water just by illuminating these things by illuminating these hybrid systems. And the same with ammonia and with uh, uh, this nitrogenase and these particles in the upper right. You know, we can combine them with these little tiny nanoparticles and we can just shine light on it and it'll make a product. Um, uh, and so, you know, one thing that we do is, for example, we just measure the amount of product that's made uh, in these kinds of systems and that so what we're really aiming to do is like to understand how are these little nano machines that we assembled, that we assembled in solution, how do they, how are they working? Like how are the electrons moving around? And so one thing we can do is just measure the like product that we're producing, uh, you know, after illuminating for like an hour, we, we go and we measure, we measure the amount of like ammonia or the amount of hydrogen that's been produced. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm specifically uh, focused on is uh, using these actual hybrid, uh, little hybrid nanoparticle enzyme systems to actually study how does the enzyme work. Uh, and so these little charts I'm showing on the right, sorry, it's, they're a little, you know, they're a little kind of in the details, but basically what we're doing here is we're observing the the active sites on the enzyme. And then as we shine light on it, we can actually watch the enzyme do its chemistry. And so that's what we're seeing on the right here is that as we shine light, we can actually see changes that happen at the active site of the protein. So we're using these uh, little, you know, nano machines to like actually as tools to understand how is this enzyme working? You know, how are the little gears or you know, not, not, you know, like, how are the, like, the little wheels spinning inside the enzymes itself? And how can we use light to unravel that? Um, and so that's kind of just an overview of like what specifically I'm working on at the National Lab. Uh, and you know, the idea, you know, these, these sort of uh, things that we're studying, you know, once we, fig you know, the, once we figure out how these enzymes are operating and like the principles that make them work, you know, that's something that other scientists can use to like, you know, to generate like large scale, uh, you know, solar processes to make these important chemicals that like, you know, society depends on. But like, we're doing the very basic, like fundamental, like, you know, how are the little gears turning in this thing? Well, uh, and so these are uh, all the kind of people working on this project. Uh, so we have a, a group at, at the National Renewable Energy Lab. We have some collaborators at uh, Utah State uh, and CU Boulder, 
Uh, and so, you know, a lot of really bright people working on this and, and helping me out and helping us move forward. But so that's kind of an overview. Uh, you know, I hope it made a little bit of sense. And uh, I hope I can answer some of your questions and any anything you might be wondering about chemistry or physics or renewable energy or I'll try and answer. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, OK, I have um, a real basic question here. When we're looking at these reactions, when you're producing hydrogen and electrons and ammonia, are those like the electricity? Like where is, like we, we talked about how these enzymes are converting one thing to another thing, nitrogen to ammonia um, or water to an electron and, and hydrogen. What do those little building blocks, like how does that turn into what charges my phone? Well, I mean, you're, so this is like sort of a different area from like, so we're not directly generating electricity. Okay. Uh, so, you know, so this kind of like artificial photosynthesis area is, uh, you know, the whole aim is really like, you know, instead of, you know, because solar panels, they're around, they work really well. Uh -huh. But you know, the, one of the big problems with, with them is like, you have to use batteries to store that energy. Right. Uh, and also we have, you know, humongous infrastructure that, uh, you know, uses fuels like cars and, and all these things. Right. And, and all, you know, and so, you know, electricity is a very important product, but, you know, the other question is, can we take that solar energy and directly store it in chemical bonds? Okay. Uh, and so, you know, that's what, you know, for example, hydrogen, you can make hydrogen and store it and then, um, you know, you, that doesn't need a battery, you just put it in a tank and, and, you know, hydrogen has other advantages. It burns completely clean, right? You burn it and you get water, uh, you know? And so the idea is like, you know, it's like a complement to solar like panels, you know? So right. like, those are important for making electricity, but we also need, um, you know, so we, you know, it's also important to, uh, you know, think about the next generation of things and like, can we make fuels directly? Like instead of, Right. taking them out of the ground could we make like carbon neutral fuel cycles where we're pulling carbon dioxide directly out of the air and making fuel out of it and then we're not adding any co2 to the air um, right and also you know making ammonia like that's just something that we need and we need the Bird ammonia soil. right yeah, yeah i mean we need that to feed people like you know totally. we need fertilizer so, right so yeah this is like a, a complement to the electricity side this is like uh you know, hopefully in the future, we can have like large scale solar production of fuels directly and not just fuels, just important chemicals. Like, you know, other things that they're working on at the lab is, you know, like next generation polymers. Like, can we make like the building blocks of plastics and stuff out of, out of these systems? Um, you know, can we like, how can we do this without using, you know, petroleum? Totally. Cool. Okay. That makes sense. Um, can we get our faces full screened again? So can you stop sharing okay. screen? It's Absolutely. easier for people to see Erin when she's a little larger. Yeah, sorry. Um, I never use Zoom so much. I know it's I, I get it. Okay, so the next question is from Amelia. Could you tell us exactly what a nanoparticle is? Yeah, so um, yes, absolutely. So a nano like so these a, a nanoparticle um basically is just like if any material um you know you can imagine taking a chunk of metal and you can cut it in half and cut it in half and cut it in half uh and basically like as you're cutting it in half it's still that chunk of metal right like it's not really different but if you keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller once you get down to like the regime of like a couple of thousand atoms or you know around there and as if you're approaching there the properties change a lot hmm. uh and so because basically well yeah like the idea is sort of the, the effects of quantum mechanics kind of start to become more important you know to, well, that, that kind of stuff but uh you know so these uh they're basically just like regular bulk materials minerals uh you know so for example the particles i'm using are called cadmium sulfide which is just a, it's a mineral, uh, uh, but you know we can basic we can um, 
you know, so once you make them that small, they start getting, you know, interesting size dependent properties that we can use to like tailor them to kind of like have the dial in the properties that we want to make these systems work, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're trying to like interact them with proteins in specific ways, you know, they need to be about the size of a protein. You know, they're like a little bit bigger than a protein. Right. Cool. Um, That's awesome. Thanks. Um, what, this is from Mercedes. What is your favorite and least favorite part of your job? Ooh, my favorite part of my job is when experiments work well. My least favorite is when, <laughs> and, uh, um, no, I mean, like, there's a lot of cool things about this job. Um, you know, it's really cool to be able to do some, you know, to like, just be kind of exploring and, and doing interesting, interesting things and learning new things all the time. Um, you know, but sometimes, you know, it does get frustrating when experiments don't go the way you want. And, uh, you know, and especially working in the lab with COVID has been a different, you know, a different experience. You know, we've really started going back in and, you know, wearing a mask all day and, and we've implemented, you know, so it's good that, you know, at the national lab, like they really have their kind of act together and we have like good protocols and, and, you know, we've been able to return to almost full productivity uh, with, uh, you know, in some, at least in some areas, uh, even, you know, just, you know, wearing, having a good masking policy and all that, but like, you know, working with that's been kind of interesting, but, um, you know, it can be frustrating. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, Abel would like to know, uh, is what you're doing effectively making, so what you're doing, obviously you're, you're making um, fertilizer, you're making uh, fuel, uh, but like, what's the difference between um, what, kind of like this hybrid protein meat uh, inorganic collaboration versus what solar panels are like currently available now, uh, like commercially that we could put on our roofs. Right, uh, yeah, so this is like a, a sort of a, a different technology. Like what we're doing with this art, uh, what we're broadly calling artificial photosynthesis is like, you know, uh, sort of a, a new, well, it's not new. We've been, you know, people have been working on it for decades, but it's it's sort of like a developing field that you know there's no like good like products yet. You know, you know, it's not like industrially used. You right. know, we're still almost in the area of like trying to make it understand what could make it work. Whereas right. solar panels are very much like a mature. You can go buy solar panels. You know, they're imported. You know, they make them here. You know, this is a very mature, well-developed technology and they're improving all the time, but like the base, you know, the solar panels have basically been figured out. Like it's not, right. uh, you know, they're making them better, but like, you know, they're there. Like, you know, you can drive around and see giant fields of solar panels. So we're basically in the, you know, where solar, solar panels were like in the, you know, in the 1960s or something, you know, we're, you know, cause these are like more, in some ways more complex systems um and we're really all, all kind of in the phase of partially you know trying to figure out how does nature do this right and how do we mimic nature um and, and learn those principles and, and how can we you know apply them so we're you know we're it's a, a much earlier phase technology basically. totally so are you hoping that by learning um how nature creates energy from the sun that you'll be able to in maybe 50 years, create a solar panel that is more efficient than the ones that we've uh, made that are currently commercially available? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so these technologies, they, they do exist. Um, so part of, the, part of it is, um, you know, for example, making hydrogen uh, with electricity or, you know, for example, right now you can get uh, these things called electrolyzers, um, so where you can take a solar panel and then, you know, split water and make hydrogen and oxygen. But, you know, part of the issue is that, um, you know, the, the best man-made materials that do this kind of stuff is like, for example, to make hydrogen, the best thing around is platinum. You can use platinum electrodes. Uh, and whereas, you know, nature is doing this with like those proteins and with like one iron atom in them. They're like two right. iron, like, you know, well, there's more, but like, a, you know, several iron atoms it's like, you know, uh, hooked up in this protein, you know, and iron is 
way better like it would be a way better thing to use than to use platinum right you know? so like part of it is like how does nature control these you know these elements how does nature control you know do this chemistry with like earth abundant things and you right. know nature does it in a very efficient way and cool. we're you know we're approaching it in some ways but you know we're still you know we're a lot of the principles are known but we're still trying to like figure out strategies and, and you know develop awesome. understanding cool um all right the next question is from marie's kids what kind of science was your favorite in elementary school oh in elementary school so i was actually very uh interested in like cosmology so like when i was in elementary school i read uh, the book by stephen hawking a brief history of time. Uh, it happened to be on a, a, on like a bookshelf. And uh, ever since then, I was like, that was like super fascinating because there's like some wild stuff in there, like the origin of the universe and like, whoa. Uh, and it was a, kind of over my head at the time, but it, it kind of stuck with me. And I think that's actually like where the, you know, the seeds sprouted of like, ooh, science. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, so I, that was like my favorite thing is like to think about like the universe like the origin of the universe stars black holes all these wild things that you can't even like conceive of in your imagination but they're real which is like they're larger than life you know? so i always thought that was really cool uh, and somehow i ended up working on the complete opposite of that it, <laughs> it's just like you know the opposite of a giant black hole is like, you know, a couple atoms. A nanoparticle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah the total complete opposite, which I don't know, it's kind of weird, but I guess this is how it worked out. Totally, awesome, thanks. Um, all right, this is from Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade combo here. Aiden would like to know, is the artificial photosynthesis an oxygenic or anoxygenic reaction? That's a good question. Uh, so, um, Oh, that's a good question. So these are actually uh, generally, and I mean, and I guess you would mean like anoxygenic in the sense that we keep oxygen out of these reactions because oxygen is one of, you know, is pretty reactive and it'll like, you know, if you expose these proteins to oxygen, it will destroy them. Uh, and so in bacterial cells, they have like clever strategies for like protecting these proteins from oxygen, but in the lab, we just got to keep them away from it. Right. Uh, and so, and like, that's one of the big challenges also in, in making these artificial systems is can, how do you make them oxygen tolerant because oxygen is around everywhere. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. something, you know, something you have to deal with. And there are strategies for that. Um, but, you know, any kind of studies that we're doing, we're just like, you know, keeping the oxygen out to make our lives easier. Right. Cool. Um, let's see. Mercedes wants to know, is there any plant that is particularly good at converting sunlight into energy that you might use as an example to base your work off of? Mm. Uh, so plants are actually not that efficient at converting the, the, um, the sunlight into you know, you, the, the usable energy that they have. So was, plants actually only use around 1% of the energy that, um, that sort of hits them, uh, but that's not really like because they can't. It's just, you know, they, they, yeah, they generally get more sunlight, a lot more sunlight than they need to actually use to grow, um, and so they have like actually protect mechanisms that protect them from use, you know, from overexposure to sunlight. They have to get rid of that excess, uh, you know, the excess absorption of light. Um, so in general, they, they like reject about 90% of the, um, they reject about 90% of the, the light that hits them. Like that goes to like, just dissipated, like it goes to unproductive things. And then I use around, uh, sorry, yeah, like three, you know, two to three, one to 2% to like actually grow and, and all these things. Right. But in, term, in terms of like, you know, systems that we try and use to understand, one of the big ways that photosynthesis is studied is actually with uh, cyanobacteria. So like algae, uh, just because those are kind of easier, a way easier to study single celled organisms because you can like, you can grow them uh, and you can put them in a test tube and take measurements on them. Whereas plants take a long time, but they're a lot harder to study. Like, you know, because we're, we're coming from like 
basically like being chemists and biochemists and like we're not going to grow a plant that's just not right <laughs> we need <laughs> something to grow something in a liquid yeah yeah, we need something we can grow in a test tube and, you know, manipulate genetically and plants just take a really long time to grow. So we really, you know, single celled organisms are, are really the, the good system to try and build your understanding. in. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. So could you just tell us what, so from a previous question, we talked about um, oxygenic and anoxygenic. Could you tell us what those two words mean? Uh, well, so they, I think they could have a couple of different meanings. Um, so in, in terms of like, I mean, they generally mean, uh, yeah, I guess I'm not sure what specifically what they mean by that. Um, maybe they could clarify a little bit because like just generally it would just mean like with or without oxygen. Right. But like, um, you know, in plants, for example, in photosynthesis, like the, you know, they, you, they produce oxygen, mm -hmm. um, in a photosynthetic process. So that's like an oxygenic process. Right. Um, and you know, so they'll they'll take light and they'll actually split water. So they'll they'll uh, oxidize the water and produce hydrogen, and then they'll take the electrons from the water and actually use it to like build their own, um, you know, to power their own metabolism. Yeah. And so that's generally it's considered an oxygenic process. And anoxygenic processes is like other like things like bacteria that live in the sea floor and stuff have to power their metabolisms in the absence of oxygen. So they use uh, other systems that don't involve generating oxygen or, or you know, to power their metabolisms. Yeah. So that's a little, you know. That's getting in the weeds. Yeah. yeah so yeah. When, um, when you're like learning new things about science, it can help to break the word down. So if it has an A-N at the beginning, that means like the opposite of whatever the rest of the word is going to say. And then genic means like to produce. So if it's an oxygenic and not oxa oxygen genic produce. So not a thing that doesn't produce oxygen. And so you'll, as you like go through and learn more science words, you're going to have a lot of words that like use the same pieces of words over and over and over again. So even if you don't know what a new word means, you can kind of break it down and figure it out. Absolutely. And so there's your science word lesson for the day. For the day. Um, yeah, no, and that's a, it's kind of a really good analogy for how, you know, because, you know, kind of being a science, you know, in this area, you always have to learn new things and, you know, that's a good strategy is like sound, you know, uh, to figure out what, you know, new papers and stuff, like what yeah. these words mean, like it really doesn't get any more complicated than that, you know, that's yeah. how you figure out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, because as a scientist, you are probably an expert in something that's pretty narrow. Like I, I'm a, I'm a squid biologist, but I'm not only a squid biologist, I'm a squid biologist that works on how bacteria and animals talk to each other. So if you even ask me about octopus vision, I have no idea what's going on because I work on squid bacteria. And so it's you, you, I think we often think of scientists as being these brilliant people who know everything, they know so much, but really we know a lot about a mm. little area because humans only can know so much. And so um, one thing that uh, we say a lot in this series is that if you want to be a scientist, really, you just have to be curious about something. You don't need to be an ultra genius. You just need to be persistent and really excited about one thing. And so uh, there, there's your uh, science life. Yeah, and willing to be curious. Yeah, and also, I mean, that get, you know, it kind of goes back to like science is so huge now. Um, you know, there's so many different areas. Uh, and so I think I heard someone say one time, uh, that basically the last person who was a scientist who knew all of science, like who knew the whole thing, like everything that was known, it was probably like Isaac Newton was probably like the last person who like knew all of science. And then pretty much after him, it was just like, got too you much. big. Yeah, it's like too much stuff. One person can't know it all. But yeah. like Isaac Newton was also like a very, very special kind of genius. Um, but, uh, you know, but after that point, you know, especially with his contribution, science became so, I don't know, large. Huge. Huge. 
yeah you know, one person cannot possibly wrap their minds around all of it for sure yeah like i i run these sessions every week and and inevitably every week i'm like today we're doing a topic that i don't know anything about even though i've been learning about all different areas of science once a week for the last two years and it's just like man i don't know anything about solar energy let's get into it so um yeah don't be intimidated um all right so the next question uh is pretty much related to what we just uh said abel wants to know is it hard to be a scientist uh you know if you really enjoy it it's not that hard i don't and you know in some ways it's not any harder than doing a lot of other things like that's right um you know and i think if you you know i, I would say it's not for everybody you kind of like it but if, if it's something that you can get into um then and then it becomes easier you know then then you're kind of driven by your curiosity um and you know and if you know but you know in some parts of it are harder than others i'll say um but, yeah you know a lot of other things are hard it's too. hard being being a human it's hard if you like science it's not like the things that are going to be hard about being a scientist are not the things that you're going to expect that are going to be hard like doing right. the experiments can be frustrating um but not necessarily hard i if you like it do it and if you don't like it don't and that is a-okay well, you know, one part of uh, the you know, question is how old was the question asker <laughs> i don't know yeah, i don't know like a different answer you give to you know depending on people's perspective yeah for sure uh, because one, you know, one thing is like, you know, someone who's like, you know, do I want to become a scientist or, well, you know, I don't know, but like, you know, do you want to get interested in science in high school? Like, that's a different question. Do you want to like maybe major minor in science in college? Like, you know, those are, you know, different perspectives. And I think, you know, you know, you can, you know, major in, in a science in college, for example, and then not become a scientist, but it would still be a like, I think it would be a great preparation for almost anything to like study a science in, in college. Like if, you know, it, I'll say, you know, it is challenging, but like that will give you the tools to do almost anything. Like I yeah. can't think of a single, like if you majored in a science, like I can't think of a single thing that you could not do after that. You go yeah. to law school, like you go to law school after that, you know, for sure. For sure do anything after you, you study science you don't have to be a scientist i yeah. think it would give people like a great perspective on the world and, and you know or you know some tools to really do anything else in their life yeah it's a great toolbox for um approach like answering questions and troubleshooting and uh solving problems for sure or navigating the world even you know i think yeah. i think it would be you know great preparation so yeah that's what i was like you know it depends on you know the answer I give kind of depends on where the, the question asker is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from AR is how long do you think it will be until we see commercialization of protein to fuel technology? Ooh, uh, that is a difficult question. Maybe even kind of a, a loaded question. I don't know. So I don't even <laughs> like so my answer would be something like, I don't even know if that's like a goal. You know, so these kind of things I study, like part of it is just like, they're kind of model systems, like they're little toy systems that, you know, we're trying to really study to get the basic science, but like, they're not necessarily viable as like the end technologies in themselves, you know, because making proteins like in purifying them like we're doing for these studies is very, very expensive yeah. um you know and it's not like you know we probably make like a few cents worth of hydrogen in each experiment and you know it probably costs like the materials alone are like a hundred bucks or something per experiment so it's like you know those kind of economies of scale don't work what we're really getting out of this is like the understanding of right. the you know we're doing the basic science and then like in the future the technologies that are commercialized will probably look something more like you know some kind of solid materials that mimic the principles of how proteins work right um that you know that can be made cheaply and at large scale you know like in a batch like a big reactor you mm -hmm. know not you know and 
you know, not to these individual proteins. Because what we're really doing is just, you know, trying to study how these things work on a small scale right now. You know, so that's why I was saying like these tech, these are kind of early stage, very early stage technologies. Yeah, like a lot of scientists are studying animals that will then build robots off of. So we're not going to actually use the, the thing in the experiment that we are playing with often looks totally different when it goes to market. And so maybe yeah. you're studying like how octopuses move or how elephant trunks move so that you can make a robot that moves like that, you know? So mm -hmm. you never know. Sometimes the thing that goes to market looks totally different yeah. than the thing that we play with in the lab. Um, so yeah. yeah. Right now we're kind of just studying nature to copy nature. And then when we copy nature, we'll, we'll sell it to people. Yeah. Here's a fun question. Is there an invention that you would like to apply your research to? Not necessarily something realistic, but um, think like your wildest dreams. What are you playing with? Like the direction that I would ultimately want to see your research go, kind of, I guess. Sure. I mean, like, so yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, what I, the direction I would ultimately love, like to see these technologies go is, uh, you know, to, to kind of help facilitate the, the, the generation of like kind of a circular economy of, of, uh, of everything really, you know? So, you know, the fuels we use, like if we can pull, you know, pull carbon dioxide out of the air and then use these technologies to directly make fuel from that. Uh, and then have like just, you know, instead of adding carbon to the atmosphere, we could have like sort of a cycle that just uses carbon that's already in the atmosphere. Uh, and then also, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can make like the precursors to plastics with this and really, you know, I, these have the potential, I think, to, to be the foundation or at least a contributing part to like a kind of circular economy that where we're not relying so much on extraction from the earth, but rather just using energy that's freely available from the sun to cycle a fixed pool of things you know, we're, we're extracting energy from the sun, but like that's very, that's kind of abundant. And, and, you know, if we can do that efficiently, then, you know, that can go a long way to solving a lot of problems that we need to solve as soon as possible, you know, of like environmental sustainability and, you know, balancing our relationship with nature. That's, you know, my pie in the sky, like, I mean, hopefully it's not pie in the sky. I, right. I, mean, I think it's quite, you know, in some way, like it's, it's feasible technologically. And I think it's very necessary. Totally. Awesome. Um, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade combo would like to know if someone wanted to go into your field, what would a potential pathway be? Um, what should they do in high school? What gr a degree should they get in college? So that's a good question. Um, you know, if you're in high school, uh, you're kind of just getting the, I mean, I, I guess, you know, college these days is more and more competitive all the time, but, you know, you want to, you know, major in science and, you know, I think in high school, you really want to kind of focus on being a well-rounded person. And I kind of wish I did that more, um, you know, so I, you know, play an instrument, play sports, take care of your, you know, take care of your health. And, you know, then you're, you know, you, that's kind of foundation you want to build for, uh, going forward and, you know, you know, if you're in, I mean, I think, you know, you'll know if this is something you want to do, um, you know, you'll, you'll be interested in those math and science classes and, and, you know, you'll pursue that. And I think, you know, it's some, you know, if it's something that, you know, kind of speaks to you, I, I, I would, you know, definitely go down that path. And in college, I would say, you know, if you could major in like, you know, I mean, you know, if you're interested in chemistry, major in chemistry or, or physics, but I would say in college, it would be very important to try and, and um, find a way to get involved in some research kind of early on, um, just to like, not because like, that's the path and that's what you're going to do, but like, get some exposure to it and see if it's something that you like, because, and like, ask around like the different professors, like what kind of projects they have, um, and find something that kind of like piques your interest um because if you find something that that does like you'll be driven to like be really get really good at it and you'll learn a lot uh and you'll also learn if you hate it 
And if you hate it, don't do it, <laughs> do something else. Um, but definitely like try it and, and see, how it, see how it goes. Um, you know, I think, you know, you can't really do anything other than that. Yeah. You know, definitely see if you hate it. If you hate it, do something else. Because there's plenty of things to do in the world. Um, I think that's solid advice. I have a buddy who loves talking about science and learning about science so, so, so much. And he's so passionate about it. But he went to graduate school for the type of science that he really likes. And he hated it. He just hated it. But he could have learned that so much earlier. And now he communicates it. That's what he does. So he like, sometimes you really like a thing, but but doing the thing in the lab can be different, but that's not the only career that exists. There are so yeah. many things that surround science that are still like science careers, but you're not necessarily the person in a lab doing the experiment. Yeah. And, and yeah, there's a lot to explore. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, even if you don't end up doing science, like I was saying, if you major in a science, like you are prepared to do pretty much anything. Yeah. Uh, super valuable. All right. So we um, are at our time limit at this point where, okay. So we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session. The first question is if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would that one thing be? Like tell them you could tell uh, one thing you, you want. There's one thing you want everybody to know. What do you want everybody to know? Uh, I want everyone to know that we can we can use the sun to like meet a lot of the challenges that will face us in the future and we need to start yesterday. Awesome. And you still have everyone's attention in the world and you can tell them one thing, but it can be as silly and insignificant or serious and big picture as you'd like. It doesn't have to be about science. It can be about anything. What do you tell them? Uh, You know, let, let, you know, there's a lot of problems that need to be fixed around. Let's, let's work on it. I love that. Yeah. Find a problem that you feel equipped to fix and start tackling it. You don't need to be the world's leading expert on a thing to fix it. Just go out there and try. That's, an, that's awesome. I love that. Okay. Um, where, is there anything that you'd like to plug? Is there anywhere that we can find you on the internet? Um, before we wrap up not too much i have an instagram but i don't really use it much uh i think it's like at bryant cheeky or something um yeah i don't uh i probably should get more into that i really enjoyed doing this uh you know loved having you this was really cool i learned a lot questions. and uh yeah i'm really glad uh, i could answer some questions and you know if you're curious about the stuff i've worked on you can google me i have a google scholar page um or, you know, you can reach out to me on Instagram uh, and uh, I will happily answer any questions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I really enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, I really, I'm glad I can like uh, kind of contribute to this uh, a little bit. Awesome. You know, I've been doing a couple other sessions with some classrooms and stuff. So it was really, you know, it's really cool. I like this. Awesome. Well, thank I'm, you so I'm, much for joining us. This was yeah, really fun. Thank you. Awesome. And Erin, thank you for signing. Um, your hair looks uh, really, you. really nice today. I just thought that you should know that. It looks really good. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. The next session we're having will be on February 5th. We're going to be talking about zombie ants. So get excited. Join us for that. You can always see what sessions are coming up on skypeascientist.com. You can also suggest or request a session for just you and your family, you and your classroom. It's totally free on skypeascientist.com. Um, and also we are a nonprofit that are, that's completely user supported. So if you can support us, we really appreciate it at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you again, Brian and Aaron for being with us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.